mess in the so. first half, but the second half of the movie, we started with the train massacre, moving into Gary Busey's Yeah, I think that looks pretty good. You see, no more, he has a big bone. Yeah. He was such a big bone. Yeah. It he was. escapes sin. Yeah, it was a big boat. It was a big, very big... <coughs> The trials of Hercules, the founding of Rome, the divine wind, the epic of Gilgamesh, and the story of Noah and the great flood. All of these are myths. And that's why we're here at the Ark Encounter in Kentucky, the United States of America. That's right, baby. And today we're gonna go over why this hunk of junk, well, this didn't happen. A few years ago, this guy decided, after writing many books on the topic, to introduce young earth creationism in a new and interesting way. He decided to take on the Noahian task of building a one-to-one -one model of the Ark. And, well, he did it. And to be fair, it looks very beautiful. You can see the footage for yourself. It really is quite a sight to behold, especially when you're, you know, not almost half a mile away in the parking lot where you first get to see it, but instead just right up to it. They, they make you take a bus, it's super weird. I was expecting the uh, museum inside to be roughly about three hours long and uh, wound up being closer to four, almost four and a half hours in which we were in there going through, reading all the things, looking at all the beautiful art that was inside and a lot of uh, uh, dioramas and some, uh, you know, just other things to read, and it was all very interesting, and it took a lot longer than we were expecting. And a lot of this was trying to show how the Ark may have worked, and, uh, you know, just trying to find out the logistics of how the Ark worked, and maybe how some scientific data could back up the fact that the Ark existed, and that there was a worldwide flood, yada yada yada, that's basically the point of the museum. But basically, the Ark was depicting uh, early stories in Genesis, and there were a lot of detailed descriptions explaining how the Ark could have worked and how science can prove the early stories of Genesis to be historical fact, you know, despite science as we understand it uh, being completely incoherent to the Mesopotamian people 6,000 years ago. They said, hey, you heard of the scientific method? And all the people in the 61st century BC of Mesopotamia are like, no, 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 I haven't. But that's kind of why I, I started to think, you know, everything in this exhibit, while it's fascinating to look at, it's all, it's all just wrong. The story of Noah has to be one of two things. Either A, it's a myth, or B, it's not a myth. But we're getting off of, into the weeds here. What is a myth? A myth is simply as the dictionary defines it. A traditional story, especially one concerning the early history of a people or explaining some natural or social phenomenon, and typically involving supernatural beings or events. Now, the controversy in myth arises when we take the uh, uh, connotation of the word myth as meaning false. And yet, when you look at this definition, the story of Noah is a myth. Again, just by that definition of it alone. And given the lack of scientific evidence for a worldwide flood beyond only young earth creationists that explain that there had to have been one because it was in this one story, most research basically just shows that there are multiple local flooding events anywhere from the last ice age, which is about 20,000 years ago, to the current day. There are floods that happen all over the place, uh, but and that, that's a natural event, but a, an entire worldwide flood, there's, there's no geological data to support that. And just so everybody knows, I'm going to put all the links that I used on here in the description, uh, but you can decide for yourself on that point. I'm not a scientist. But ask yourself this, take any culture that has a worldwide flooding myth, and there are quite a few, and ask yourself this, 
How do they know the entire world was flooded? Did the people who were saved in this flood travel the entire globe? Did maybe they had like a satellite bird's eye view and they were able to see the entire world was flooded? Did, did God just tell them? And if God, being the one true God, told Noah it was the whole world, who, who, well, who, who told Gilgamesh that it was the whole world as well? Who, who told the uh, Native American uh, people about the worldwide flood? What are they called? The Ojibwe? Ojibwe? Who told the Ojibwe people? That's probably not right. The point is, the, the fact that multiple cultures speak to this event, it becomes more likely that they were just localized floods in these regions uh, that seem to span the entire world in their view. And the stories of these events were passed down through the oral tradition until eventually being written down hundreds or even thousands of years later. The, the point is, is that because multiple cultures have written down this event, it is more likely that these were just localized floods that happened that just seemed to span their entire world because it was all that they knew and all the people that they knew. And these were later passed down through the oral tradition until they were eventually written down hundreds, if not thousands of years later. However, there are people that just absolutely take that Noah's Ark has to be solid historical fact. And you know what? That's why we went to the Ark Encounter, to go see for ourselves. Since we can safely assume, as well we are told, multiple people have written books in the Bible, both the Old and the New Testaments, over the course of thousands of years. Now, with that, we can conclude that it is possible not every book nor every author writes the exact same way. What if I told you there were different genres in the Bible? And in the case of Genesis, the earlier chapters are in the genre of ancient Near Eastern mythological literature. What if I told you that not every single line in the Bible is meant to be taken as literal, scientific, or just historical fact? What if I told you that even though Noah's story is not one of historical fact, it's still true? Now, a lot of books in the Bible are meant to be taken Historical from Joshua to Second Chronicles, those are labeled as the historical books in the Old Testament. That's the same way that the New Testament Gospels and Acts, which the Gospels are written to be in the genre of ancient biography, uh, but that's much the same way. It's meant to be a, essentially, for lack of a better word, a history book. But what about the prophets in the Old Testament? Are they also just a history book? Now, most people aren't arguing whether the prophets lived um, in the time and setting that the actual book takes place, but clearly these are different kinds of books, are they not? They're not just a, a telling of historical times, they're a countercultural voice against the king or the people of Israel that have turned away from God's will. Well, what about Proverbs or Ecclesiastes or Song of Solomon? Are, are these just history books or, or is it more likely that they're a different kind of genre? See, this is the point that I'm trying to make. Not every single book in the Bible is a history book written as objective fact as we understand post-enlightenment. Each book is trying to convey a central idea, and it all works as a you know, meta-narrative, but each book has its purpose. And that's what the first 11 chapters in Genesis are doing, separate from the type of literature found in the rest of the chapters, which start with the story of Abram. The point of these early chapters is to separate the theology of the Hebrews from the other ancient Near Eastern cultures at the time, and also to try to find a certain lens through which to understand reality and morality. The point of Adam and Eve wasn't that they lived in a perfect world and everything was perfect and perfect was perfect and, and great and everything was great and everything was grand. Everything got the whole grand. wide world. Got the whole wide world. The point was about the development of consciousness, I think at least. The forbidden fruit, the serpent says, will grant you immortality and you'll be just like God. But once Adam and Eve eat from that fruit, they suddenly realize that they're naked. Well, why do they realize that they're naked? It's because they see their most vulnerable selves and from there, they're able to derive a, a moral ethic. 
because as uh, Jordan Peterson says, uh, if you know what hurts me, I know how to hurt you. And well, that's the bloody thing, isn't it? I don't think he says it, isn't it? He's not British. If, if, if I, if, if I know what hurts me, well then you bloody well know I know what hurts you. <laughs> but anyways, the creation story says that there is only one God, which is huge for any pagan to hear. Not only is there just one God who created all things, but this God declared that the things that he created was good. And this is wild for any ancient Near Eastern uh, culture who essentially believed that the world was just the carcass of a chaos serpent and they were made out of its dung. See, th it's a theological point. The point isn't that, well, if God didn't make the world in six days and then take a vacation for some reason, then he's no more real than Richard Dawson's flying spaghetti monster. The point is that God created an ordered world. He created three spheres of existence and then he filled those spheres on each day and then rested at the very end. See, it's as George Lucas said. It's like poetry, so if they rhyme. It's like poetry. No, that's Jordan Peterson. Ah, uh, yeah, it's like it's like poetry. It rhymes. I think that was almost that was almost Peter Griffin. I mean, not to mention that the Ark Encounter literally says that the Earth was created in an exact six days, where you saw evening every single day, despite the sun not being created till the fourth day. Okay, well, I, I'm, I'm getting off on a tangent here. The point being. The Adam and Eve story, like the Cain and Abel story, like the story of Noah, like the story of the Tower of Babel, it, it's all a story containing theology meant to separate the Hebrew culture from other cultures that lived near them at the time, the ones that they were influenced by. The Epic of Gilgamesh, which is a very similar story to the story of Noah, says that the gods flooded the world because the humans were annoying them. The gods are rash creatures with little care for human life. Now, Noah says that God sees humans acting horribly against the very nature of himself, which is all good in their theology, and so he wipes them off the planet, save for one noble family. These are very different, and they are different on purpose. And on top of that, too, the flood that washes away everything also has a theological meaning. The Sea of Chaos often referred to and understand by this culture in their writings, is where the Leviathan lives, the, the sea monster, the serpent of chaos. The same one, too, that God says he has slain in the story of Job. Again, not uh, directly alluding to the fact that there was a Leviathan in the sea, but the fact that God has created and being able to destroy chaos. The home of this monster, the sea, represents chaos in its pure form because well, of course the ocean is chaos. I mean, Jesus, have you ever seen a hurricane? It's it's terrifying. Or have you ever watched Deadliest Catch? Watch out, you guys. So, by flooding the world and then promising not to do so again, God is saying through action that he has completely conquered chaos yet again. Again, these are all theological claims that the early Hebrews are trying to instill into their society. And yet, the answers in Genesis people just choose this hill to die on. To them, if any any minute aspect of the Bible is not absolutely historically verifiably accurate beyond parables, maybe, then I just throw the whole Bible out. It's completely discredited. That's why we're going to put the Joel Osteen clip up. Why? <laughs> now, I'm not an expert in biblical studies, even though I've read a few books, and I'm not an expert in anything scientific beyond you know, anything I've watched on the Science Channel growing up as a kid. But it's apparent that people like Ken Ham need to have the Bible be a history book, not a theological text on which morality is founded, but a historical text on which science is founded. But here we are at the conclusion. I didn't even get into the fact that dinosaurs are just on the ark for some reason, like all over the place, just dinosaurs were just there. I, I don't know why, but they were. Actually, my favorite video, I'm going to see if I can find one, is 
uh, a recreation of the Garden uh, the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, and they're just like dinosaurs around. They're just like, what's up, guys? That's right. We were here too, baby. I think that's hilarious. <laughs> no, Noah didn't survive a worldwide flood. And no, that does not mean that the Bible is incorrect. With, with all this in mind, try, try cracking open the Bible and ask yourself this. If this truly is the authoritative word of God, maybe God's a bit more interesting than your high school biology textbook. And I suppose, well, maybe that's the heresy of Ham. <laughs> okay, thank you everybody. We, we finished it. We did it. I got through it. I'm sitting on a really bad part on my couch. It's really hurting my bum, but uh, we're, we, we got through it. So like uh, this video, uh, subscribe, comment on here. What do you think? Uh, do you think the Bible is uh, just a, a history book written by God for some reason? Or do you think that it's... Uh, let's say a revelatory scripture aided by God, but written by people, uh, which is why there are many mistakes. And I didn't even get into like source criticism of Genesis where there are multiple different authors actually writing certain sections of Genesis. And you can see this if you break down the language. I didn't want to get into that. Maybe I'll do that if we do like a follow-up video specifically talking about Genesis. But beyond that, uh, subscribe to the channel. We got a bunch of other stuff. We usually do more entertainment movie stuff but i really wanted to do this and since i basically control jake and chris i get to do whatever i want so that's a lot of fun for me uh well <laughs> it's over